Well, today is part one of a two-part series on our throwaway society. And I got inspired to talk to you about this from spending a day and a half up in Plano, Texas a couple of weeks ago when I was visiting and working with a couple up there. They got me a very nice room. For you that don't know me, I'm a psychotherapist in my other job, in my other part of my life. And this couple had me come up and they put me in a very nice hotel, the Marriott Hotel in Plano. It's on a lake. There's a walk around it, a walking trail, and you know some nice little stores over here. But one thing that really stands out about this hotel is it is huge. It is a very large, maybe four city blocks hotel, maybe bigger. So when I was going up to my room in the elevator, I heard one of the other guests say, this is the hotel of long hallways, isn't it? (laughs) And she was not kidding. I got out and I walked a long hallway, and then I had to turn and walk another long, hallway to the end to one more long hallway and my room was the last one in the corner. So my point is there are a lot of rooms in this hotel. A lot. So I got in Sunday night about 9.30 and I was a little bit hungry and so I thought well I'll call room service and order up a little bit. Well, they no longer have regular room service. They have what's called quick bites, and they pride themselves on getting you your food within 15 minutes or less. And so I ordered an English muffin, and it came in 15 minutes or less. In this plastic container. With this plastic container full of uh, cream cheese, this one was full of jelly, this one was full of butter, and of course, this one was full of plastic knife, fork, and spoon, and a paper napkin. Now, I'm not sure what I was supposed to do with the spoon and the fork with the English muffin, but they sent this in this very nice plastic-coated bag. The next morning I got up and I ordered oatmeal. Oatmeal. Brown sugar, which I asked them not to send. (laughs) Honey, which I asked them not to send. (coughs) Sliced almonds and berries. And silverware, knife, fork, and spoon for my oatmeal in a nice plastic bag. For lunch, I ordered chicken and noodles, ginger chicken and noodles, and it came the chicken and the noodles. And the ginger broth to mix them all together. This was full of onions and cilantro. I did get some nice, you know, if I wanted to use these, which I'm not going to, because I used the silverware that I asked them not to send, because I had enough silverware. The next morning I did the whole thing over again with oatmeal, and for dinner that night, I forgot, I also got just one chicken cutlet, which they sent me with silverware that I requested they don't send me. This doesn't even represent all of the plastic cups they sent as well. I threw away some of the things because one was had milk in it and everything. So, it all came within 15 minutes as they promised But at what price? Because I am just one person in one room in one hotel. Now, I don't know if the Marriott 
has these quick bites in all of their hotels, which are about 4,000 around the world, or if it was just in America. But I do know that's a lot of plastic. I had one English muffin, two bowls of oatmeal, one lunch, and a very small dinner. And that isn't even all of it. So when I talked to the manager about it, he said to me, oh, this is our new program. It's great. We have eliminated all of our china and all of our stemware and all of our silverware because we don't want our guest to be bothered with having to have a table rolled into their room. It was depressing. And I was shocked at how much of a throwaway society we are. In fact, when I started researching for this sermon, I thought, oh my word, it's much worse than I imagined. So, I want to share with you how bad it is. Because, after all, we're a community. And bad things, we have the bad part, because we help to carry it together. And besides, misery loves company, right? So I want to start with food. There was a research study in 2004 at the University of Arizona that said that 40 to 50 percent of all of the food harvested in the United States is thrown away. 40 to 50 percent of our food is thrown away. Now that includes restaurants and that includes grocery stores and markets, 40 to 50 percent. But it also includes you, because statistics show that we, myself included, throw away about 25 percent of the food that we buy. That means if you go to the grocery store and you buy four bags of groceries, as you walk out the door, you just pour one into the trash can every day. That's how much we waste. In the meantime, we have 50 million people in the United States who are what is called food insecure. They live in a food insecure household, not knowing if they're going to have enough money to buy food for their family. So let's talk about trash next. Brittany Ayers is a biological engineer, and she wrote this article stating, America is the number one trash-producing country in the world. Now that means we are 5% of the population of the world, and we produce 40% of the waste in the world, which is shocking to me. I didn't know it was that bad. America produces 500 million tons of trash a year. Now, this sheer volume of trash pretty much is made invisible in our country. But there was a moment, and I don't know if you remember this, in 1987, when a garbage barge left Long Island. It had 3,100 tons of garbage on it, and it traveled around the world looking for a country that would take it. They went to over five countries. Everybody said, no, thank you. Can you imagine? So they changed the policy, and now this is a true story. We actually pay countries to take our trash. Not only are we trashing America, we're going to third world countries, paying them to have mountains of our trash. Now, the EPA says that from 1905, when New York City started waste management, to 2005, 100 years later, we have increased our trash about 17 times per person. It used to be that a person had 92 pounds of trash for a year. Now we have 1,742 pounds per person, every man, woman, and child in America per year. That's 4.7 pounds of trash every day. Think about this. America here, 
we throw away more furniture than there is furniture in a lot of countries. We pitch it. Think about cell phones and water bottles. Any of you ever drank a bottle of water from one of those plastic bottles? Anybody not ever had a plastic bottle of water? I don't see any hands going up. So we are part of the masses. On the website Ban the Bottle, they state that last year, 2015, Americans bought approximately 50 billion bottles of water. Now, our U.S. recycling program is at about 23%. So that means 38 billion plastic bottles got pitched in the trash last year. Now, I don't know how accurate that number is. 50 billion? It just seems like a lot to me. And I don't know because maybe it's inflated because they're on the Ban the Bottle website. I'm not sure. So I took half of that number and I did the math. 25 billion bottles. And what it comes out to is America uses 2.5 million plastic bottles of water every hour. Like, are you kidding? And almost two million of those get thrown away. Which brings me to our landfills. Let's talk about our landfills. Lisa Kiss wrote an article in 2013 called Planet Thoughts. And in that, she says, landfills are not really, have never really been designed in order to break down trash. What they are designed for is to bury trash. There's actually a plastic liner, and then the trash gets put in, and dirt on top of it, more trash dirt on top of it, etc. And because of this, the trash does not decompose with air. And so it takes a lot longer for anything to decompose. Like a normal orange peel will take six months in a landfill to decay. One cigarette butt takes ten years. One of those plastic holders of a six-pack takes up to 450 years to decay. This is not good. And one interesting fact that Lisa says in her article, which I was blown away with, is if we put all of our collective landfills together in America, they are the size of Pennsylvania. Shocking, but that's not the worst of it. The worst of it about our landfills is because there's no air in the decomposition process, what happens is it produces methane. Methane gas is a greenhouse gas that is 20 times more potent than CO2 in trapping heat. Ever heard of global warming? (laughs) Think it's happening in our landfills? I do. And I don't even want to tell you about the trash in the oceans because it's so depressing. Well, I'll tell you about one part. There's something called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Now, it's not like the Great Pumpkin pumpkin Patch of Linus's. It is the Great Pacific, the Pacific Ocean Garbage Patch. It is now, right now, today, 1.3 million square miles. The UN says it is so large now, they can see it from space. Ooh, yikes. How bad is it? Pretty bad. We are absolutely ruining our planet. But I got to thinking, how did we get here? How did we get here in the first place? I mean, we're all smart people, right? I mean, how did we go from the values of our grandma, my grandma, that said, be thrifty, do not waste, do not take more than your share. If something breaks, fix it. Take care.
care of your things. Now, how did we get from that value system to where we are today? Well, the best I can tell is we have been duped. And I'm here to out the duping. With the invention of the assembly line, that was about 1900s, the beginning of 1900s, there began this process of mass production that could happen quickly. At the end of World War I, people were happy, celebrating, and they were ready to spend money on some of that mass-produced things. Over 60% of families bought a radio in the 1920s, and we all got interconnected, and advertising took off. And then, at the end of the 1920s, the beginning of 1930s, this amazing manufacturing philosophy developed called planned obsolescence. You've heard of it, I'm sure. Manufacturers made it their goal for their products to break, to fail after a certain uh, amount of use so that we would buy again. One economist that I read when I was researching said, and don't think that planned obsolescence isn't alive and well today because it is. He says they actually make stuff to be useless as quickly as possible so that we will chuck it and get a new one. And I'm thinking, but why? Why? Because our economy runs on consumerism. That's what makes it work. It keeps the money rolling. Yes, we are destroying our planet, but Wall Street and investment people are very happy that the money keeps rolling. Eisenhower's chief economist said that the American economy's ultimate purpose is to produce and sell more consumer goods and to get us to buy them. How have they managed to do this? Well, according to Rachel Tulip in her article, America the Wasteful, we waste because consumers easily submit to the advertisements around them. We are all persuaded to buy the new because we are taught that new is better. Advertising actually trains consumers to think I need that product, that new and improved. It convinces us that the more we have, the happier we will be. Only it's not true. Things at beyond our basic needs don't make us happier. In fact, our happiness index is going down in America since the 1950s. According to Christy Gardner's blog on saving the planet, our income has increased so much that our discretionary income has increased as well. And so we're all eating more, buying more, using more, and guess what? Throwing more away. Why? Because we can. We have extra income and we're being duped. Planned obsolescence and advertising are just part of the ways that that duping happens. There's also another trick in manufacturer's back pocket called perceived obsolescence. And this is where they get us to throw away perfectly good things because they are no longer in style. I'll give you an example. Astro's jerseys. Now, we have lived in Houston for about 30 years, and since we have lived here, their little outfits have been red, white, and blue. They have been blue and white. They have been orange and white. They have been orange and white and black. They have had pinstripes. They have not had pinstripes, etc. And our little boy, who loved the Astros that we went to opening game every year with, had the latest and greatest t-shirt on for his opening game. 
because we bought into the duping that we have to have the latest and greatest. Who, after all, wants to wear something so yesterday? So we buy, and the manufacturers are happy, and the government is happy, and the gross national product goes up, stockholders are happy, and we're destroying our planet. Next, we have something called manufactured demand. That is the story of the water bottle. Now, bottled water costs about 2,000 times as much as water out of our tap. So how have they gotten us to buy 25 billion bottles of water? Well, about 20 years ago, the sale of sodas started to go down. People started getting more into health phase, and Coca-Cola noticed this right off. Pepsi-Cola noticed this right off. And they started a campaign, a scare campaign, to get us to be afraid of our tap water. They led us to believe that our tap water is not clean. But this is not true. Many tests were done, lots and lots of cities. The water was as clean and sometimes cleaner than the bottled water. And yet still this campaign misleading us went on. And the irony is Pepsi now makes Aquafina. If you dress that, if you drink that, that's Pepsi you're supporting. Coca-Cola makes Dasani water. Both of those waters are out of the tap. It's the same water that we get out of our tap. Now, the thing is, they do put it through a filter, but we can buy a filter, and we can save thousands and thousands of plastic bottles from going into our landfill. Because let me tell you, the campaign that we need to drink bottled water is working. Bottled water is the fastest growing market in the world. The global market was valued at $157 billion in 2013. And it's estimated to go up to $280 billion in 2020. At the same time that this campaign started, guess what else started? Recycling. Recycling became more and more in fashion. Now, according to Michael Braungart in his best-selling book, Cradle to Cradle, recycling lulls us into thinking we are not part of the pro problem. It lets us throw things away a different way without guilt. And yet, only about 23% of the things that we recycle actually get recycled. And the energy that's used, the, the petroleum that's used to recycle might make it not even worth doing at all. But recycling tells us we are good people and we are not throwing this away. We're recycling it. Yes, we are being duped. And there's one more way that manufacturers do press, and that is patriotism. I want you to think about 9-11. After 9-11, President Bush could have said anything. He could have said, go home, hug the people that you love. He could have said, honor your grieving. He could have said, we need to come together as a community and see each other and love each other. But that's not what he said. Do you remember what he said? He said, shop. He said, if you want to help, get your credit card out and go and shop. Buy stuff. Because that's what makes the machine work. Now, now we know it is pretty bad, and also how we got there. So the next question is, how do we get out of it? 
And I will tell you that we are fortunate because as you used Unitarian Universalist, one of our seven principles, seven, we only have seven, and one of them is that we respect and honor and care for the interdependent web of life. That we recognize that we're all on this earth together. We're all interconnected. And that we have a responsibility to take care of the interdependent web of life. The other thing that Unitarian Universalists stand for is we stand on the side of love. And I think we ought to put those two together and stand on the side of loving our planet and caring for it. There are lots of ways we can do this. And next week, in part two of this series, we'll talk about the solutions. It's a cliffhanger. You have to come back. You have to come back to go through the solutions. But to prime the pump, I want to tell you one story and give you two challenges. So here's the story. One of my sons, when he was in ninth grade, went to Camp Choye with his whole class. They were divided up into groups of eight and assigned a table. They had to eat at the table with the same group all week, all their meals. In the middle of the table, they had a bucket And the people on the first day, all the students were instructed, whatever you don't eat, whatever's left over on your plate, please scrape into the bucket in the middle of your table. And they did that. And guess what? The buckets were pretty full. Day two, they were told the same thing. If you have anything left over in your plate, please scrape it in the bucket. And there's going to be a competition to see who can have the least in their bucket. So that day, the buckets were pretty empty. And the students were stuffed like little piggies. They were miserable because they ate every bite on their plates. They were not going to lose the competition. The third day, they were told, the lesson here is take smaller portions. Only take what you can eat. If you're still hungry, you can go back for seconds. But we need you to figure out how to keep the bucket empty and not to be stuffed little piggies. And these children, because they were smart children, figured it out. And they came up the rest of the week with an empty bucket and not overeating. So, that's the story. And this is the challenge. I challenge you this week, for one week, and I want you to report back to me next week how you did, not to throw any food away. Not by becoming stuffed little piggies, but by eating portions that are reasonable. And if there is leftover food, putting it in your freezer to bring out another day and eat it again. I know myself, when I go out to eat, the portions are often large. And I think, I am not going to waste this food. So I get the to-go container, and I put the food in it, and I bring it home, and I put it in the refrigerator, and I don't eat it. So not only am I wasting the food, I am wasting the container that they gave me, the styrofoam container. So my new pledge is to carry my little Tupperware with me in my car. It's out there right now. And if I have to go, I will put the to-go food in, take it home and put it in the freezer to when I can pull it out and I know I'll be at home and not traveling and I can actually eat it. So that's the first challenge. Second challenge is for you, for one week, not to buy or drink anything in a plastic bottle or a plastic disposable cup. That means no sodas, no water, no juices, no all the other things that we sell now in plastic little bottles, not one. I challenged myself on this the last two days, and I failed both days. 
I have to tell you, I did bring a plastic water container to work, and it tasted awful. The plastic was not good. And so I had to drink a bottle of water at my office both days. I confess. Now I have a stainless steel one that my husband bought me, and the water tastes great. So I'm going to challenge myself for a week, and I challenge you as well. And finally, I want to end with a story that my younger son told me this week. He works at a teaching land lab, Blackwood Land Lab, where he takes groups of children out into the forest and onto the land. They own 60 acres of land. And he teaches the children to notice nature, to connect to it, and to appreciate it, and really enjoy it. And at the end of all of his sessions, he asked his group, what is it that you would like to pass on to your children about nature, about your experience in nature today? The answers always include how beautiful it is, how peaceful it is, how fun it is to discover, how relaxing it is. And this week, one little girl raised her hand and she said, well, I know the real answer. And he called on her and she said, this is all God's land and we need to take care of God's land. I don't know about that word God in the sentence, but I do know that we have been given a stunning amazing world that is beautiful beyond belief. And I think we should take care of it. It's our home, the blue little boat spinning that we share. And I think as Unitarian Universalists, as human beings, we should take care of it. Blessed be and amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Come back next week, part two.